Great. Oh, well, that's good to hear a bit about what, what you guys do. So, so um, we, we, we make games in London, in the UK. I'm, I, I founded Planiac, and I'm a game designer, and I'm a programmer as well. Um, so I come to game designing through, through, pro, through being a programmer. We work a lot with Flash. We are working with Unity. Um, we've, we, we have a game out at the moment, and that's one of the reasons I've, I've been in New York, is to show it at Indicate, where we were finalists. And we also um, are working on two new game productions that are in early stage development, and um, um, which we're kind of working with at the moment. So this is um, a talk um, about some of how we approach game design. Now, some of it will cross over directly with things that you already do, that I can hear you've done. Um, some of it uh, might be slightly different takes on how you, you do things. Some of it might match what you've learned in class. Some of it may not. This is stuff that we use in the field for games that we've designed um, either internally or, or with clients, because we do that, we do that as well. So um, there's quite a few slides, and what I might do is um, flip through, and I'll jump through some bits a little bit, because I, yeah, I think you might kind of be well familiar with them, and I'll go a little bit slower or on others. So we'll, we'll take it like that. Um, so, um, oh, that did work, great. So yeah, the, we, so in the UK, we've worked um, on lots of commission productions, and also on our own games. So these are some of the people we've kind of worked with on, on making games, and here's some screens from some of the games we've done for various people, from the BBC to, uh, actually there isn't a Channel 4 game there, um, to Brands, to Nickelodeon and DreamWorks, etc. Um, and so I actually gave this talk in uh, Toronto about a year ago, and at that time Occupy Toronto was going on. And I thought what was really interesting is you had this kind of group of people, and they had something they wanted to communicate about, and actually this was going on internationally, it was happening all around the world at that time. And they had this sign up. Um, so you can see there, this is how they communicate within their discussions that are going on um, in, on this site in, in Toronto. So if there's a discussion going on, someone wants to block the discussion, they'll do that. If they've got a question, they'll do that. If they disagree, they'll do that. <laughs> and if they agree, they'll do that. So this is how they do their dialogue. Um, I then a week before had been in the UK, and actually we had exactly the same thing going on outside St Paul's Cathedral, a really ancient building in the centre of London that you should go and see if you're ever there. And so they had a similar sign up, but all the codes are different. So like, I have a point, I disagree, so all the signals are different. So if you put all these people together, they've got a similar, similar goal, they've got a similar result in mind, but they really would have no idea to communicate. And I, I thought that's interesting in relation to game design because Actually, we have a lot of different people who come from a lot of different disciplines. They may not have much, lots of experience of the other disciplines of the people they're working with, especially when you then go and work with, say, broadcasters or out in industry with all kinds of different people. And you need to find common language. So a lot of what I call our toolbox of game design is about finding common language. It's about finding ways to um, enable the members of the team to communicate and understand what's going on without needing to be a, a coder, without needing to know art a lot but still find ways of doing that. So that's what we kind of reach towards, and that's a bit of really what this talk is going to be about. Um, and a way that I find it's really useful to do that is not so much to play your game, because you haven't made it yet, so you can't play it, but we do a lot of stuff around playing with your game before, and that's really game design, isn't it? Playing with your game to refine it and develop it and make it better as you go. Um, so I'm kind of keen, keen to make the distinction between those two things. So early on in the game, what are we doing? We're doing kind of concept development. And um, so at this early stage, we haven't really got a huge idea about what we're doing, but we tend to get a lot of people together in a room. We tend to get like the key people involved in a game production all in one place, around a table. We'll spend an afternoon together. There might be expert, experts there if we're making a game that kind of has particular like, relevance to a specific uh, area of, of information. We'll have an expert there. We'll get everyone together, and we'll brainstorm and discuss the game. And usually coming out of that, we'll have probably too many ideas of what we might do with my mouse gone. Ah, oh, here we go. So, um, this is really a stage of widening, like all the possibilities of the game are there, and we actually need to refine them a little bit. Um, so, what we'll then often go and do, now this is slightly, can be slightly controversial because it's, we don't actually necessarily always make a game design document, like a really big document about game. But then also we're not making AAA titles, so we, we, we tend to try and keep things a little bit more fluid. But we're quite early on at this point, like having widened out all of our ideas with, um, with uh, our, those conversations, we narrow it back down to a written spec about what the game is. And that could be two paragraphs. Um, or it might be longer, or it could be 
five pages. Um, so that's the closest bit we get to a, a GDD. Um, and so um, that's a way to kind of crystallize our ideas that have come out of the brainstorming process a little bit. So um, I'm going to talk about an approach that we've used in the last couple of games we've made that we found quite useful. And um, I call that interactive wireframes. So coming out of the, um, the written spec, um, we'll often go and make, and this isn't right for all games, and none of these approaches are right for every single game. They really vary with the game. But we've made interactive wireframes, which are a really good way to communicate about the game to lots of different people. So um, here's a game we made for uh, Brit uh, British Gas, which is a UK utility. We made a kind of an ecological adventure game set on an island for them. And here's an early interactive wireframe screen of one of the, of the map screen of the game. And, um, and so it shows, actually this, was a non this is a non-interactive wireframe. This one was just a graphic, actually. But it's designed to show, I mean, have you, have you, have you done wireframing with games as kind of part of design? No, OK. So um, it's designed to show none of the design and all of the functionality and, and what the GUI might be, but none of the design of the GUI. So it's a way to, you can give that to a designer and they find that really useful and they go, okay, I know what I need to design on this screen, but you can give it to a coder as well and they'll say, okay, I know what the screen's going to do. Now again, it's relevant more and less to different games. Like, you probably wouldn't do it with all of the levels of a first-person shooter, but you might do it to design the GUI of a first-person shooter. And you certainly would do it for the screens around the core part of the game and the flow through the game. Um, and so that wireframe ends up, once we've, whoops, as this screen, so that those are the same screens. So the wireframe shows an island that you travel around in your blimp and you unlock level by level and that we needed to design a set of locations that would go from locked to unlocked. And the final screen in the game, there's the blimp and there's the island and there's actually six levels locked. These are six locations dotted around the island. So those are, those are directly parallel, but obviously they look very, very different. So when we uh, came to make um, this game, International Racing Squirrels, which was a game we made with Channel 4, a public service broadcaster in the UK. And um, this is the game that uh, we're shown at Indicate. Um, so International Racing Squirrels is a, a race management sim where you control, you run, build up a team of racing squirrels. Um, there's a web version and it's out on iPad. Um, so this is a game that we, oh, there's a bit of info about the game. So we've had some quite nice responses to that game. So this is some of the reviews we've had. And we've launched this online last year, and then last fall we launched it on iPad. And um, so this game we made, we, 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 uh, made interactive wireframes for, which I'm going to show you. Um, we've shown this game in various places. So Indicate was where we were showing it here, and in LA, and then we've shown it at other other events kind of in the UK and, and, and further afield. And next month it gets shown at, um, at, GD, at, at um, Game Connection in San Francisco. Um, and actually here's some of the fun we've had kind of showing this game off. Um, so actually that's, that's indicated at Momi a couple of weeks ago. Um, so um, um, we took this game, and we, 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 we kind of took this game to iPad. So this is a game I'm going to show you the interactive wireframes for the initial version of the game, and then we readapted it slightly, and we made this iPad version that has, has the screen layout like that. So, um, so I'll show you how, how some of these sc screens got designed in this process. Um, so this is actually the interactive wireframe for the home screen of International Racing Squirrels. So that's this screen that you see here. <coughs> so you can see... Really, they look totally different, and that's because the wireframe is not supposed to show any of the design. But what it was showing is that um, we knew that on this screen we wanted four homes for the squirrels, for your squirrel team members to live in. We wanted four training activities for your squirrels to use to train up. So we'd done game design to that point. We knew that like the squirrels would go into the training activities. They'd spend some time in there. Then you click to see the results, and we knew that you would go into homes or you would buy homes if they weren't yet available. And then also we knew that generally in the game you wanted to jump to team, shop, and bank screens. Now that, that works in this kind of game because it's a kind of management sim type game, or someone called it a casual sim. Um, and then we knew that we would have a timer that told you when the next race was coming up, and a timer that told you when the next builds were coming up. So all the functionality is there, and here's some of the information we wanted to show. The name of your team, your XP, and the date. 
So we, know, we knew all this information was there, and at almost all of that directly transfers to here. So, oh, this is, actually, hang on. Yeah, yeah so this is the finished version of that, of that screen, actually in action. So, like, here you can see the home, and clicking on the home takes you into the home. Now, this is a screen that wasn't in that wireframe yet, but this is a home interior and one of the squirrels, and then clicking on the squirrel shows you data about that squirrel. So all of the elements that were in that wireframe are present in the screen. If it goes back to the home screen, which I hope it will, you can see that here we also have the team, shop, and bank buttons. We had the four activities along the bottom. So the two directly informed each other. Let's have a look at another screen in the game as well. So um, this is the race screen. So we knew in the race screen that we wanted, it's, it, because you're not actually directly racing on the track, it, you, you're managing your racing team, we knew that we wanted an above view of the race that would show progress in the race. And we would have a kind of position indicator that was a slight tribute to Mario Kart style race representation. And we wanted a squirrel cam that would show you the face of your squirrel. And then also we wanted some kind of mini game around the poor action of the squirrel to kind of put you in the race during overtakes. So how did that come out? So again, looking at all of these um, elements and even the fact that there'll be a logo for a race up here. Um, oh, here we go. Sorry, yeah, that is the right screen. I will let me do this now. So, okay, so this is a user going to clicking race now to go into the races. There are these eight race tracks in the game. We, we've just designed another eight actually as well that haven't gone in yet. And so um, the player is going off to the racetrack, choosing the squirrel they want to enter. <clears throat> and in a second or two, you'll see the screen that we just saw the wireframe for. Oh, you fly off to the race location in your private jet. <laughs> and there's a little squirrels kind of sitting there in the plane. <laughs> First class, of course. <laughs> OK, so this is the racetrack. So all the elements that I just described are here on this screen. You've got um, the, the display of position, top left. You've got the above view of the racetrack. You've got the squirrel cam, top right. And it's telling you what lap and what your position is. And we'd, we'd added some more stuff. So we'd actually added like this palette of, of weapons that you use in the race as well. So that, that hadn't yet been designed at the point of that wireframe being made. So that's another screen of the game. And let's see. Oh, so also, we I'm actually. Getting those rhythms right, I'm getting a boost ahead. Yeah, so getting the timing right gives you a boost during overtake and improves your chances of succeeding in the overtake. Um, you can still not overtake, but it will help. And, um, and also, if, you're get, if someone's coming up behind you and, 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 and are about to overtake, you can reduce the chance that they'll succeed in overtaking. So that's one of the mechanics you use in the races. And then the other one is your power ups. And we're working on some other mechanics that, that we'll add to future iterations as well. So what this video shows is when we were doing testing, and I'm going to talk a bit more about testing shortly, um, we actually took these interactive wireframes. That's the, that's the interactive wireframe for the entire game. So not just the two screens that we just looked at, but loads of other screens, but there's one of them um, in use. And what's happening is we're playing the game. So a little bit like doing a paper test. This is like a digital paper test, maybe, in a way. You, this pupil at a school um, in South London is able to go through all the screens in the game, and what's happening is someone is sitting next to him explaining what the game would be doing at each of these points. So they're saying, you won the race, you lost the race, you've got this number of points, you, you, your XP has gone up to this. So we're kind of playing the game, but it, you know, it's a leap of imagination. But the interesting thing is, this is before a single line of code has been written, and before a single screen of the game has been designed. So it's a, a really early stage to do some really useful testing about your game design. Again, not all games will suit doing this, but we found this really useful. Um, and it was also something when we were working with Channel 4, the, the UK broadcaster, we were able to do that with them as well, so they could see what we were doing really early on in the production process. But, you know, this is really, really early. You really haven't made anything yet, other than your kind of raw game design. So, interactive wireframes. Um, compared to static wire wireframes, they kind of do all that, if you were drawing up static wireframes, which some people use, uh, they do all that that does. Um, they give a really clear sense of screen flow and some of the sense of the dynamics of the game. Um, they're really easy for people to understand, whether you're a designer or a coder, you look at that and you kind of know what's going on on that screen. Um, so they're therefore useful for both of those teams. They're actually 
not hard to maintain. We make them with Flash. So if you, if you can use Flash for making your games, you can use Timeline Flash. So it um, doesn't even need to be AS3. Timeline Flash can be used to make that stuff. In fact, I think AS2 is slightly better because you can put stops and, and, and next and things like that on the timeline. And they can be used for live testing. So that's what we like about interactive wireframes um, for the games for which it's th that's useful. So another thing that we do that I've heard already that you do is paper testing. So this is our, our paper test toolkit. And so again, with International Racing Squirrels, we, did, we built a paper model of the game. And we took that to um, pubs in the UK. And we got members of the public and members of our team to come and play the game. And again, before a single line of code had been written, and before a single screen had been designed, we had played this game. And we also got a sense of the aesthetics, what I call the aesthetics of the game. Are you, are you familiar with the MDA model of game design? So uh, that's mechanics, dynamics, oh. aesthetics, yeah. yeah? And there's, if you look up MDA, you're, there's a paper on, online about that. So it's, a really, it's one of the lenses through which you can look at your game design. But it basically separates out the mechanics, which is the actual behavior of the, of the game system, the dynamics, which is the actions that you're carrying out, and the aesthetics, which is um, how that feels and what the emotional response is and what, the, what, the, what, the, what, the, what it feels like to be in the game. Um, I've probably grossly simplified that and missed out 90% of what that, that design ethos is about, but that gives you a little bit of an idea. So we know that with this stuff, we can convey um, dynamics, in fact, we can convey several of those things. And one of the aesthetics that we wanted to sense in this game was what did it feel like coming up to the end of a month in the game when pressure was rising for you to go and pe pay your bills after you've done a set of races. And we, we tested that aesthetic of the game using paper testing. So this is a paper version of the home screen. It's got the, the calendar. It's got your homes. It's got your activities. It's got the squirrels that you own. Um, actually, sorry, this is the activities section. So you can see that one of the squirrels is in the weights activity. Um, this is the race screen, so these are all the races, and you could actually play these races um, and using dice and using various values. It didn't have to be as designed as this, by the way. You can do, as you probably do, you can, your paper test can be easily just as good scribbled as, as designed. It's just that because we were making several copies, we kind of made it look nice. Mm -hmm. um, and then we took that to, as I said, to London pubs, and there's some of the game, that's all, those are all, oh no, that's two members of the team and one friend um, working on the game. And we also took it and played it um, with our clients. Now, that, script, that photo reveals that we did actually cheat. So like the rule of the paper test really should be that it's all paper and dice and stuff like that. But the race calculations involved about 60 dice throws. So we decided to uh, still only simulate dice throws, but to do it with a spreadsheet. So we modeled, we put dice throws into the spreadsheet. And that was a quick way to do all the dice throws. Um, and here's a paper test for a new game that we're working on. Actually, that, that logo name is no longer correct. but. Um, this is a kind of more above view map based game that we're making at the moment. So that's it being tested on paper as well. So paper testing um, it doesn't convey the mechanics of the game because those are going to change quite a lot when you go into a computer. So like usually you're abbreviating the mechanics or you're kind of you know use, using dice instead of uh, 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 so you don't really get a lot of the mechanics. Um, I feel, but it does establish the game dynamics really early, and it conveys a substantial part of the aesthetics of the game. Um, so it's a really useful format. You can, you should be rapidly iterating when you're doing paper testing, changing things a lot. Happy to throw away anything and bring in anything new. Try it, play it, and then you know fail quickly, as they say. Um, and it's actually a really fun way to test game games very quickly. Um, so that's paper testing. Um, I'm going to do this a bit briefly, but creating game assets is always quite fun. And so when we had to create the assets for Racing Squirrels, by the way, how, um, what's the what, how long have I got? 30 minutes. Another 30 minutes. Yeah. Great. Um, and we'll all of it. And that's it. That's including uh, Q&A. Yeah, there's some things. Yeah, great. OK. So I'll, I'm going to do this a bit quite briefly, but um, the game assets, like to make all the squirrels for our game, um, as you may have done in your game design processes, we actually started with text. So we wrote bios for the squirrels that we wanted, and we worked with our scriptwriters to make those bios. Then we worked with our artists to kind of make quite early sketches. So there's a sketch of one of the squirrels, Tarantula Talia, Tuxedo Tim, Hissing John. And all of those sketches were taken into uh, test groups, and we let people play with them and pick them up and look at them and respond. And then they were refined a little bit more. 
And then actually, we actually decided to have a major change of art style, and we went to this kind of 3D model toy approach, which is what you would have seen in the finished version of the game. So, still the same character, like that's still Tarantula Talia, but you can see how differently interpreted she is there. And once we'd kind of hit this approach, we really liked it, and we ran with this approach. And so that's Tuxedo Tim, and that's Hitting John, the squirrel that no one dare question whether or not he's a squirrel. He's <laughs> <a squirrel. laughs> and um, having taken that approach, we had a lot of fun with putting the squirrels into the gym. So here's Tarantula Talia working out um, to improve her strength in the game. Here's Tuxedo Tim doing Squudo, the ancient squirrel martial art that improves your focus in the game. And this gave us the opportunity to animate something that you'll probably never ever see again in your lives, um, which is a snake <laughs> pretending to be a squirrel on a running machine. I mean, that's, 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 the, you know, that's, that's a, a, I think that's a rare sight in, in, in life. <laughs> so, um, I won't go into lots of detail about, about game assets, other than to say, share them and test them and, you know, communicate about your assets and um, be ready to throw stuff away. So actually what the process, what happened halfway through that process, which is that major change of art style, be brave and do that. Like, if you need to do that, go do it. Um, that, that gets you the best results. And, 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 you know, we wouldn't have got to the result that we're delighted to have got to if we'd not been willing to throw stuff away. Um, so actually, that slightly leads into um, user testing. So um, often seen as a less popular part of get designing games, I think it's actually really important. Um, lots of user testing, lots of user feedback. Even though I've now kind of played international racing schools with audiences in loads of locations now and seen it on lots of stands and exhibitions, I'm still learning stuff about how we can improve the game design when I look over someone's shoulder and see the game being played. And believe me, I've, like, I've seen that game played so many times, but I'll still see one new thing that we could do. And that, that never stops, actually. Um, so, you know, there's no end to what, how useful this kind of testing and, and user testing can be. And, um, but you have to really make sure you listen to it. Like, watch it. Don't be too protective of where you've got to with your design. Be willing to kind of throw stuff out and try things um, because you can see that there's, a, there's something that's coming up in user testing. Um, so here's some early user tests just with those sketched characters from the game in a school, uh, in the same school where you saw the other testing happening. And we're gathering feedback and um, we've got people to kind of talk to us about the characters and fill in questionnaires. Um, there's some testing of early versions of the, the Apple version of the game, I think that is. Um, and hit, we capture video of the test. So this is like four players all playing an early version of the game. It's already changed a fair amount since then. But we look at every single click and everything that they're doing. Um, and just using this video was a really good way to understand how users were using our games um, and capture all that and then take that back into our design process and do lots of good refinement on the game. We also, I don't know if we'd always do this, but we also did lots of kind of questions and stats and analytics. So like, we asked people loads of questions and we got all the data back and we assimilated that data and then took averages about what was good and what was bad and what we should change and improve. So um, that, you, that wouldn't always be something you do, but it can be useful when you're working with um, like an, a, a larger team or with a client and you want to kind of um, sh demonstrate why you're making certain design decisions. And that, that can give you good information to kind of back up a design decision with. So user testing. Um, Be clear about what you're testing. You want to know kind of what, what it is you're looking to find out from user testing. Test at several stages, right from the beginning, look and feel, through to alpha, beta releases of the game. In fact, as I said, it never really finishes. Um, it's useful feedback directly from your target audience. Um, actually, it's quite good to get any members of the team, key members of the team, into the test room, because they'll believe it when they see it. Um, and it's really honest, so like people will be, you know, they'll be really complimentary about your game and they'll love something, and then they'll rip your heart out instantly like with something like, I don't like that feature, I didn't like that, and it's like, oh, I really like that feature, but maybe you're right. So, you know, be ready for all of that. Um, take all the feedback and use it, make the best of it. So, uh, so that's user testing. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about balancing games. Um, and so, this kind of goes alongside the user testing, it's happening with the user testing as you kind of refine the balance of your game. So how do we do that? Well, actually balancing, I, I think, is really difficult, um, especially for complex sims. But in all games, it's, 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 it's actually something that takes a lot of time and a lot of thought to get right. I kind of see balancing as being a bit like um, having your, your, your game is actually a bit like the Mars rover, far, 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 far away 
on Mars, and your development team are a bit like, oh, well, I've got that one as well. Um, oh, yeah, okay, so actually, um, it's not like the Mars rover, because the, 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 the Mars rover, the delay for signals to arrive at the Mars rover is only 3 to 30 minutes. Um, that's not long enough. So your game design, as you've released it into testing for, the bal for balancing purposes, the journey through the game is a long way in the future. If you've got a game that's, say, three hours or 10 hours or 30 hours to play, finding out where your balancing is is 30 hours away with any player that you put that game in front of. That's a long way away. So actually, it's further away than the Mars rover is in terms of communication. It's actually more like this deep space probe that NASA model. This is a, an illustration. It's not an actual spaceship that's 10 hours in the future. So I think that um, every time we change a, a setting in the present, we're affecting the future. And it's sometimes quite hard to see how that happens over a long game that takes a long time to play. So it's quite a delicate art, balancing the game. So how do we do that? Well, one of the things we did with this game is we started with some quite in-depth um, formulae that we wanted to apply to various things in the game. So we, we, we kind of modeled the mathematics of the game with gentle curves for all the features of the game. So that's a curve that shows the performance of a squirrel versus the mood it's in. Um, and there's a formula for that. And that's, um, that shows the performance of a squirrel versus his energy. So by using um, these equations, we're able to model stuff accurately. And that helps with balancing a little bit. Kind of coming in the front end, it means that you've kind of thought about how all these systems are going to kind of work together. We also used um, an external testing company. Um, and we also designed the whole cycle of the game from the beginning as well. Um, and then we did lots of iteration and refinement. But working with external testers was really useful. So we, they're the same people who test things like Little Big Planet. Um, they're a company called Testology in the UK. So we gave them the game, and their testers go off and play for many, many hours and write a long report back. So that's a really good way to kind of get that kind of journey into the future to happen. So we also use analytics. So we put analytics in the game right from the beginning, and we use that to gather data about the game, and that's a way to find out what users are doing at any time through the game. So I'm going to give you an example of analytic refining a small bit of game interface and how that was a useful thing to do. So this was um, um, a game screen, a login screen for game. And um, we were working with a client who didn't want us to use um, Facebook, say, to log in, wanted us to kind of have users put in a username and a password. So we were kind of aware that that might be a problem because how many times have you kind of put in a username and a password and then kind of come back to a, a website and thought, what was my username and password? And then also for data protection reasons, because uh, we have to be very careful with data we, we store, especially about young people, they also didn't want to capture email. So we also couldn't take the email address and then send the user an email reminder. They didn't want us to do that. So we knew that this was something we had to approach with our game design. One thing we did was like a big red stamp saying, important, write down your username and password. So we thought, well, maybe that will help. Maybe that will be OK. Maybe kids will read that and write down their usernames and passwords. So that's how the screen went out live with the game. And here's our analytics. So we used analytics to show that this is all the people using the game. And so the first thing is people loading the game. And so th oh yeah, these are all the people attempting to log into the game. And then these are all the people succeeding in logging into the game. Now, what's interesting is the yellow is people coming new to the game. So what's happening is most people who arrive new at the game, if you ignore the purple, most people arriving newly at the game, yeah, you know, there's always a few people who kind of go, oh, I can't be bothered to log in, or I don't want to create a user, or oh, I don't, I'm not sure if I want to play this game. So yeah, sure, you lose a few people. So it goes down a little bit. So the number of people trying to log in and the number of people succeeding on logging in the first time they come to the game, that's fine. But the purple is the problem. This is the number of people who are coming back to play again who try to log into the game. And that's the number of people who succeed in returning to the game. So like, that's a really huge drop. So we're losing 75% of the people coming back to the game. So analytics was a really important thing to do. Because we'd already said to the client we were working with, look, we, we are worried about the screen. We think there's a problem. That there will be a problem here. But to be able to go back to the client and say, look, that's how big your problem is. You're using a huge amount of your users was a really strong big thing to be able to do. So analytics is really useful. And that's directly using analytics to influence game. <coughs> so the next version of that screen will be different. Um, we used analytics to measure international racing squirrels, and that was really exciting to see. So we got some amazing responses to that game when we put it online. So this is a, this is a free web version um, 
that anyone can come and play and leave at any time, and yet they were staying for 43 minutes on average every time they came. So we were really excited to see that. And people were just playing the game and are still playing the game for huge amounts of time. So more than 10 minutes, sessions that are more than 10 minutes, most people who come to the site play for more than 10 minutes, and quite a lot of people who come to the site play for more than half an hour. So we could see all that from analytics. And um, this is an analytics graph of the of playtime. So it shows us that at each of the levels in the game, so there are 26 level, levels mapped here. And so we're seeing that on average, people are taking, um, that's, that's five hours. So they're taking about two hours to get to level six. Is that right? To get to level eight. And they're taking about um, five hours to get to level 16. And then they're taking about, people are on average taking about 30 hours to get to level 25 in the game. So that gives us a really good sense of like the, the, the flow through the game. Um, and so, balancing your game. Start with a system-wide strategy, the right formulae, the right kind of design from the beginning about how you consider balancing and how things will, will, will work and interweave. Start with the findings of your paper testing. That's actually quite useful. So actually, variables that we worked out during paper testing, we took into the coding of the game. Um, Refine using the user test results. Refine using the user testing company results if you're, if you're doing that. Refine using analytics or any gate data capture. It doesn't have to be Google Analytics. It could be you sitting there with a questionnaire and watching someone play and filling in the data. So I've used the word refine there three times. Lots of refinement. Iterate until it's right. So that's the process we use for balancing this game. Lots of refinement, lots of iteration. OK, so to wrap all of that up, um, this is what we've used. This is, these approaches are approaches we've used for lots of our productions. But every project is different, and we don't always use all of these stages. Sometimes we cherry pick some of them, sometimes we use all of them, sometimes we try something new. And sometimes we just kind of work out the game in a totally different way. So, but these are all useful tools that I kind of call a toolbox for game design. And um, I'm going to finish off with... Um, the trailer for International Racing Scrolls. <laughs> if it will play, hopefully it will play. Are you taking it from the internet? Or no? Sorry. no. It's credited to Noise 5000, um, but yeah, I, I did it. Um, actually, I, I did the music on the game as well, on this particular game. So I, I wrote and recorded and, and, and rapped that, yes. But sh don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, um, we'll do a QA and a now. Um, and there's my info. Oh, I've, oh, I meant to put my email on there as well. So I'm rob at playniac.com. And there's our Twitter. That's, that's, um, so there's our Twitter at Planiac, and we're on Facebook as well. And I'm RB Davis on Twitter as well. So if you want to kind of keep up with what we're doing next and what the games we're making, that's all, that kind of all gets posted on there, including like preview links and invitations to come and test stuff with us as well. So, so um, do, come, do come and do that. It's a subliminal message, that.
<laughs> okay, so um, I thought we could do a Q&A session, yeah. and um, I think we've got about a quarter of an hour or so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, um, any questions? First hand up. Um, how did you get into gaming? Good question. <laughs> um, I actually um, uh, saw a computer when I was really young and thought, wow, what's that? <laughs> and um, started programming when I was pretty young and started making a game in my bedroom when I was 13 and it actually got released um, when I was 14. It wasn't that great a game actually, but it, back then it didn't have to be that great to get released, I think. <laughs> so the game was a text adventure game called The Colonel's House and it was put out by a company called Rabbit Software on some mm. early computer platforms. So I did that when I was like 13 and 14 just really because I wanted to and because I got into computers and because it was quite easy to get into programming computers then. I think now, like, they're trying to change it right now with things like the Raspberry Pi. I don't know if you have that over here. Like, there's a need for really young people to kind of program at a really young age and that's really important to, 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 to getting into programming. Um, so then I did that and then I, I, I went and studied and I did my, all my exams and things and I went to, and did a degree in computers and then I went into the industry for a little bit and then I went into and then I started doing my own games, and um, it started kind of gradually with making games with Flash, and it's kind of evolved from there. Yeah. And I've always been interested in playing games, and yeah. yeah, you know, whether it's board games or computer games, I've always played games and kind of wanted to do that. Awesome. That's I, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. It's a little more about like the, the process. Sure. Of making the game. Um, it might have happened, but I'm pretty sure it didn't. Uh, like you woke up one day, say, ah. Fat squirrels racing for bread money. Like, how did the brainstorming session went? Like, was so you could get a good idea. Squirrels racing, rent paying. Yeah. Like, how do you get that? Good question. So that's probably a little bit of that thing I described quite early on in concept development stage. You get the right people around a table and you talk about what you want to do. So actually, the 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 the, the kind of kernel of this game, the starting point of this game, was a few people in a pub. We, we, tend to use, we seem to use pubs, public has a fair bit, I probably shouldn't encourage that, so yeah, I, I, yeah in a cafe, no, but in a pub, uh, in London, and we kind of sat around and we chatted for a few hours, and we talked about where we, what we wanted to start with, like what we wanted the game to do, which in this point we knew that we wanted to make a game that had consumer finances in it, actually, so we knew that was a starting point. And um, actually, um, a, a fellow called Matt, who programmed all the back end and social systems of the game, was at that table, and... Um, he had been told this idea that like in a brainstorm you should say, you should try and say one of the most silly, ridiculous things that comes to your mind. So he suddenly said, international racing hippos. And we were like, yeah, that's a good idea. Racing hippos, that could be really fun, that could be really interesting. So we came out of the first brainstorm with the idea that it was a racing game, a racing management sim about hippos. And then we went away and we did lots of refinement and thinking about the game and, 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 and looking at different ways to approach it. And like, um, and then at one point in the process we kind of switched and we thought, no, actually, squirrels are, are faster, more feisty, they hoard money, and they're also kind of really good characters to play with. So we kind of switched to squirrels. But that's how we came up with that, with that idea. We didn't wake up in the morning. We, we, it was a group effort, you know, so you get people together in a room and you, you talk and that's how you can do that. Uh, how long does it take to make this game and how much do you spend? Um, so, the pre-planning stage um, was several months, and um, that's partly pre-planning and the complexity of pre-planning partly depends on who you're working with. So, if you're working for a commission client, th there's 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 a bit more pre-planning because you're needing to kind of um, show what you're about to go into production doing, and you have to kind of get that signed off. And there's lots of sign-off stages. So, pre-production actually was probably about three months, and then the actual development. I think we started it. We started coding and designing in April 11, and we put the game live in March 12, although actually we finished coding it a fair bit before that, but there was some, mm -hmm. uh, there was server stuff to work out with the technical infrastructure team who, who, who were putting the game live, and so probably we'd finished coding most of the game kind of in fall of 2011, so maybe that's from spring to fall, and then like there was refinement and iteration from fall to spring. And 
did the client come to you with any sort of requirements, or did they just say we want we want whatever you want? So in this particular case, so that will always be different from project to project. We've tended to do projects where we've designed and invented the game quite substantially and worked with a client to kind of get them their goals. Um, but it's it's you're the game designer, so it's better really if a client is saying, right, this is the kind of thing we want to do, um, what will you design as a game around that? Um, I think it used to be more the case that a client would say, oh, we, we decided we want to do um, a, uh, an Asteroids game about chocolate bars. And like, that's, that's the wrong starting point, because why, why an Asteroids game? And like, you need to find out why, and if it's an Asteroids game or if it's a totally different kind of game, and that's your job as the game designer. So we tend to try to avoid the situations of like an Asteroid game about chocolate bars, because usually a, a formal game design process hasn't happened and you're shortcutting that and then you're not going to end up with a good game. Um, so in this case, the client had put out a brief of the kind of things that they wanted to do in that season and that had lots of different areas in it and we picked one area and then we responded to pretty much one sentence in the brief. But actually the game that you saw with the journey around the island, the ecological adventure game, like the entire brief for that game really, well there was a long document, but the entire relevant part of that brief was we want to do a quiz game a green quiz game. That was, that was really all we had. So we took that and ran with it to spin it out into this idea of this island with all these locations and this baddie and this blimp and the journey and unlocking locations and cleaning them up. So that's the great, that was the game design process. And you know you might think with a quiz, like there's not much I could do with a quiz, but actually you can have a lot of fun even with a quiz um, when you kind of like uh, take that into a process of, of design. Um. About the playtesting, yeah. you were talking about sort of the, the dev team, the game designer, and even the company members, like to see if people playing. Mm. I, I talked to a lot of game designers and even read some books that some people would rather have no one there, like they have a new <coughs> host that just like, yeah. hired to be there. Because even if you don't say anything when people are playing, you if you see that that I just did something that you're not expecting, mm. your your face would react in some way, some yeah. way, and that would probably bias how the player would play from now on. So yeah. like I taint the the results of the the, the play testing. Yes. So do you think that this could happen if you play test with a lot of that team, like just all walking around pressuring people because they need to play in the right way? I think there's value in both approaches. Um, this is stuff I've learned in the field. I mean, actually, I haven't read. There's lots of those books I might not have read, actually. However, and I've seen both kinds of testing. I've sat in on both kinds of testing. You know, I've sat in on the kind of testing where you've got video screens and two-way glass and people who can't see you at all, um, as well as very interactive testing. When we're doing testing directly with, with people, you know, if we got you guys to all play the game, and if I was testing it with you, I would very consciously not be responding. And when people... And, People quite often, they're playing your game, and they turn around and say, what do I do? And I won't answer that question, and I won't actually, I'll be very neutral. So I tend to, I, and I'll, or I'll say, um, look at the screen, or something like unhelpful like that, <laughs> because I want them to work it out, and I want to see what they do to work it out. So um, I, I'm not so worried about such subtle amounts of psychology that the slight reaction of my face is going to influence the outcome of my test, because I think there's a huge value in you being in that test, and you seeing you seeing the hesitancy. Someone could write in a document, people don't know where the home button is, right? But if you can see the hesitancy, and you can see where they move their mouse first, and that, oh, they tried there, and they tried there, and they did that, and they looked a bit confused for a minute, and then they click the mouse, the home button, that really helps you design it. And actually, something that I find really useful to do that you would lose if you weren't at the test, I like to design around what people do expect our game to do. So, for example, we see a lot of people in that race screen go and click on the, um, the squirrel cam. Now I'm still trying to work out, okay, if they're gonna go and click there, let's make something interesting happen when they click there. Like, so that might get lost in, you know, that's not, a, that's not a known bit of interface and it's not a useful bit of interface, but why not design your game around, there's a, you know, so it's a two-way process. You could design your game around what people are generally doing when they play the game to make it a better experience for them. You design it under their hand in a way. And that's why actually, when you look at some of the really uber-designed freemium iOS games, I don't know if any of you play those games. That's why whenever you do something in those games, they respond and something happens. Because every single possible thing that you could do, a designer has looked at and thought, hmm, we'll make something happen when you do that. So you know, that's, it's a, that's a non-intuitive way to approach designing a game, but why not? It, it works. So um, that's why I think it's really valuable to have people in the room. But yeah, by all means, brief them to stand back and watch, um, watch from a distance 
and not answer questions and try not to react and observe and be an observer. Mm -hmm. How hard is it to turn the wireframe into the actual game? That's the whole game yeah. wheel job. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's that's the bit. Yeah, that's uh, you're not converting. You're not really converting one to the other. Really, the, the interactive wireframe is a kind of document. Yeah. So there isn't any. Nothing comes across from one to the other. You're you're starting the game build at the point when you start the game build, but the wireframe is something to look at. So our designers looked at the wireframe and you know had that in mind when they were designing screen layouts. Um, and the same with coders, you would look at each screen and you'd say, oh, you could get a quick sense of like, oh, I've built that button and I've built those features, but I haven't built that, and that's oh, I've missed that. You know, so that's that's quite useful. It's quite a useful piece of spec. I haven't played the game. You said it's premium. Is there in-app purchase that allows me to unlock new content, or is it all supported? By so at the moment, you can download it on the App Store. It's I think it's either ah, that was a we had it reduced over indicated. It might not be reduced at the moment, but I think it's something like a couple of dollars on the App Store, and then also um, and that lets you play and it gives you like loads of in-app currency. But you can also top that up at some point if you want to. Although you, I, I think at the moment the game doesn't really require you to need to in any way. So. Once you've got the game, you can play through. You can pretty much play through all of it. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the, there's a lot more games these days that have a server that the game is constantly communicating with, or mm. getting currencies and things like that from? Can you talk a little bit about? Uh, you, and you mentioned engineering and some of that that stuff. How much of the, the cost that might represent on a project, mm. and and um, the sort of metrics and considerations for games that are. That are so actually, um, we did build a back-end system for all of our Facebook interaction on the game. So there's some Facebook stuff um, in, it's not on the iPad yet, but there's stuff to do with you can challenge friends to races and things like that. And you could swap squirrels with friends and things like that. So most of our back-end was to provide that functionality. Actually, when we came to do the back-end for things like in-app purchase, um, we just used Apple's systems. So we didn't build a back-end to manage that, so that might make it less secure or more prone to hacking. We don't we don't actually store or uh, monitor um, user user progress in the game on our own servers. So, but we the game talks to Apple's systems to uh, get currency. And so you're using maybe a, a third party analytics system to sort of report back. All We're using those. Flurry for analytics, which you can embed in Flash. If you uh, have you used Flash and Air to make iOS apps. No, not yet. No. So if you're working with Flash, you can um, you can publish out of Flash using Air to Android and iOS, oh. and that's actually quite a nice way to turn your your Flash game into an iOS game. There's some design considerations in terms of optimizing that for, and you should be using Stage 3D. Really, if you want to do that, you should use Stage 3D. Um, but then you can use an Adobe Native extension to plug into the Apple Store. And so that gives you all the App Store, I, sorry, the to plug into Apple Store for IAP. So actually our iPad version of the game, which I haven't got with me, um, plugs into the App Store for IAP, it plugs in for iAd, um, it uses uh, Game Center, so we do high school tables and achievements on Game Center. We've also got uh, notifications, which we do through Urban Airship, no, is it Urban Airship? Yeah, I think so. So Air, Air, Urban Air, I think it's Urban Airship. Um, is a notification service Flurry, and we plug into Flurry for notifications and Tapjoy for a paywall. So we use all those services, and you can get native extensions that extend Flash if you're building Air apps to do that with. Um, so we didn't have to build a lot of that stuff. We allow, so I would say allow a bit of time for the integration and for learning how to, if it's the first time you've done it, for learning how to communicate and set up products on iTunes Connect and then set up the products in your local game and make those two things talk to each other and get the signals through, like allow a bit of time for that. But because you're not building any custom stuff, um, it's actually pretty, um, I wouldn't say straightforward, but it's it, it's kind of intuitive how you would go about doing that. Presumably if I was in, I, in the game and I wanted to send items to my friends, you would need to do that for the Facebook, you would need to build that custom. Uh, that well, yeah, we haven't yet done that for the iOS yeah. version for the tablet or, 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 or phone versions of the game. Um, but there is a Facebook plugin as well. Um, so, but yeah, we, we use the backend. The backend server is what validates the messaging. And like, so if I send you an, uh, a squirrel, um, the backend server stores all the data about that squirrel and validates it, and then it arrives on your system. So that does use the backend. Yeah. Are you um, are you planning to put those uh, for the iPad version? Um, 
that depends on what happens next with the game. So, uh, so yeah. So uh, I, I don't yet know. Is it is it like is it popular on Facebook? Like do people trade? Yeah, but that's what, so we we d we designed four Facebook mechanics for the game, and that's been a really nice feature in the game. So like you can you can when you win a race, you can send champagne to your friends. Um, <laughs> When you uh, have a squirrel that's good, you can sell it to your friends and you get money in the game and they get a discount and you get more money than you'd get if you sold it regularly. Um, when you, um, you can send a cup of tea, which is very English, of course, to your friends <laughs> to boost their squirrel's performance. And there's another mechanic. Oh, you can send a race challenge. So, so a friend can play a more advanced racetrack um, by receiving a race challenge, even if they haven't unlocked that racetrack yet, because there's like eight tracks and they unlock on three different levels. Um, but that's um, those Facebook mechanics aren't yet in the iPad version, but we've got those yeah, in the online. Yeah, they're, they're, they're on Facebook. And yeah, I, and that's been that's a popular thing to do. It's quite a nice way to kind of let people be social around your game. And there's yeah. lots more you can do with that. I mean, you know, by, this is by no means a full social game implementation like you might see in a farm build type game. Yeah. So you said that like you keep updating, you're still updating the game till this day, right? Um, when do you know like? Yeah. So do you know when to stop updating? So there's the idea of, have you come across the, the, the term MVP? Most valuable player? <coughs> most, no. Most, most valuable player? No, no. And not MVP in like games. Minimum viable product? Minimum viable product. Minimum viable product, product. yeah. So MVP is minimum viable product. So what you're doing in, it depends on, 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 on how you're doing this. You know, if you're working with a major publisher and um, you're developing a whole game, and that's quite, you know, that's planned. You might, you might, you might not release at this point. But there's an idea that you know you release very early, and you release the minimum viable product of the game, so the least that can be played. We didn't do that with Scrolls because we actually finished a product, and then we released it. But um, MVP is an approach where you you invest for front end, you build the minimum playable version of the game, you release that, and you gather feedback, and that might be the feedback that answers that question. So you might, you, in, a, in a design process, not in this one, you might be putting out the game and seeing whether people like it and quickly finding out if it's totally unpopular and you don't want to go further with it or if it's really popular and you should go further with it or, or somewhere in between those two. So it's a, it's a live decision and with these kinds of games where you can release updates and they're digital downloads, you can always update, you can always add new content. Adding new content brings players back to the game, it brings new players to the game. Um, you should have free content that's added to your game. There, there can be paid content that's added to your game as well. So it's all part of the kind of, I guess, a dialogue with your players, and you have to kind of get a sense of what they want and if they want more and how popular your game is. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you might do alongside the marketing of the game. Um, we tend to now have a release plan. So, like, we've got a plan for our new games. We've got a plan to MVP, and we've got a set of releases we'd like to do, and we'll go as far down that road as the game's popularity justifies. Rob, we probably have one time, uh, time for one more question. Great. One last question from anyone? Just one. Well, or two quick it's questions. Just Go on. I mean, uh, remember the, the chart about uh, how many hours a player has yep. to play to get to a level? And I saw there was like a huge spike yeah. between 24 and 25. Yes. And I know that if a guy is on 24, he's already like super engaged in the game. So he probably wouldn't quit easily. Yeah. But isn't like the, the, the big spike uh, like kind of a turn down for players? Like I was like leveling up quite easily and then suddenly I had to play like, twenty five thousand hours to level up to one level? Um yeah, I don't I don't know what the exact times are between levels, but the time to, to go between levels does grow as you get later into the game. And the and the levels the game's algorithmic so it can carry on forever. So you could, I mean people have played up to way further levels than twenty five. Um, but the time does increase, and that's kind of increasing the challenge um, of the game. Um, but yeah, that's a good question, and, and yeah, I mean, I'm, and I'm not, I can't, I'm not sure offhand what the times are up at that high end of the game between level jumps. But one of the reasons for the shape of that graph is that as you go further into the game, uh, that graph was made a little while ago, but, but also as you go further into the game, you've got less data because you have less players, so there are, it's a less... One of, that's one of the reasons why it's less smooth. So probably if I looked at the data again now, and we have more samples, we'd probably find the curve was smoother anyway and didn't jump. Oh, cool. thank you. Rob, okay. thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, can you, I didn't have time to catch the...
the, the, your Twitter. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so we're at Planiac um, on Twitter, and if you use Facebook, we're facebook.com slash Planiac. And my personal feed, which is not there, is if you look at my name, Rob Davis, and you take out the O, it's R B D A B I S. So I'm at R B D A B I S on Twitter. Oh.